Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining this virtual kickoff conference to launch the joint OECD European Commission project under the name Shrinking Smartly and Sustainably, Preparing Regions for Demographic Change. My name is Mikel vidal Bové. I'm a policy analyst at the Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division at the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities of the OECD. And I will have the pleasure to be moderating this event that should last one hour and a half and finish if we're apt enough to stick to the schedule at 3.30 p.m. Central European time. For your information, this webinar is being recorded and the slides that may be used by some participants will be uploaded onto the project's OECD website soon after this event is over. You can find the link now in the chat. So I can see that the numbers are keep going up. Um, so we're currently at about 70 participants, 65 participants. Before starting the event and to allow participants enough time to connect, let me remind you about what's on today's menu. After some welcome remarks by both the European Commission and the OECD, the OECD will present the structure and the main objectives of the project at hand. After that, we have invited four experts uh, that will deliver a short presentation each. And before we end with some closing remarks, we will devote some time, some time to questions and answers from the audience. You can send your questions as we go using the Q&A section that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So as I hope you will see, um, there is a, um, the project that we are presenting here today is very relevant and, and very interesting, and so are our speakers and panelists today. So I will give the floor uh, to start with to uh, Dorothée Alain Duplet, du um, she, um, she is uh, the uh, head of the Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division at the uh, OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Dorothée, the floor is yours for your introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. And good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be, to be there with you to, for this kickoff uh, event on shrinking smartly and sustainably. The title of this project may seem a bit provocative, but shrinking smartly is a challenge that many regions in the EU and in the OECD have to address since we know that half of OECD regions will experience population shrinkage by 2050. It is a top priority for governments at all levels, and it is very good to see the strong leadership that the European Commission has taken over the past few years on this topic. I would like to thank very much the Commission and DG Radio and Wagner here uh, for partnering with us, with the OECD on this important work stream. So let me briefly say a few words on the scale of the challenges at stake, the OECD's approach to tackling population decline and the focus of this new project. So just a word on, on the scale. Almost all OECD countries, with the, the only exception of, of Greece, have seen the share of their population living in metropolitan regions increase over the last uh, decade. At the same time, the share living in non-metropolitan regions has declined. In parallel, another trend is the growing demographic pressures on regions situated far from cities. We know that from, uh, by 2050, half of OECD regions are expe uh, expected to experience a population shrinkage. Rural regions, especially the remote ones, have seen the highest increase in elderly dependency ratios in the past two decades. But remote regions won't be the only ones affected. Some cities will also experience shrinkage in the coming years, especially in Europe and in Eastern Asia. So population shrinkage is a challenge for different types of regions across the OECD, even if remote rural are more strongly affected. In these shrinking regions, governments need to adapt infrastructure, housing, public services, to a new population scale in a way that is consistent with environmental objectives. This will be challenging. 
Depopulation and aging lead to a mismatch between infrastructure service provision and the built environment on the one hand and the needs of local population on the other. There is, for instance, declining demand for certain services such as education, but increased demand for others such as health and long-term care. Implications for policymakers at all levels of government are considerable and they are often underestimated from the de delivery of public services to local finance policy, land use, spatial development, infrastructure, and so on. So at the OECD, we have launched since 2019 a work stream on preparing regions for demographic change with the support of key partners like the European Commission and countries like Korea and Japan. Our approach is based on an understanding that temporary measures based on subsidies that have tried to revert population decline in certain areas have tended to come short. At the OECD, we have decided to take a different approach to tackling population decline. We have put a stronger emphasis on the need to develop long-term planning strategies for services and infrastructure to ensure that they are sustainable and can adapt to credible demographic scenarios. This requires accurate information and data on the cost implications of delivering services in the present and the future. We have also emphasized how important it is for all regions to mobilize their existing assets and resources to improve both their economic performance, well-being, and attractiveness. In addition, OECD studies have shown the importance of innovation, skills, and digitalization to raise productivity and future-proof economic development. Our work has included thematic work as well as country reviews. For example, in March 2020, we launched a report on delivering quality education and health care to all. This report offers recommendations on how to better adapt provision to face the challenges uh, of distance, demographic change, and fiscal belt tightening. In 2021, we released a complementary report jointly with GRC on access and cost of education and health services. This report provides internationally comparable fine-grained fine present and future estimates of the cost and physical access uh, to education and health services in European countries. One of the findings of this uh, report uh, is that the annual cost per student in sparse rural areas compared to cities is 20% higher in primary schools. By providing such data and information to policymakers, the report aims to support evidence-based policy decisions aiming to ensure both cost, cost efficiency and a sufficient level of access to services in all territories. For the country reviews, we have carried out several, several reviews in, in countries like Estonia, Spain, Portugal and Korea, for example. In these studies, we have also looked at how a shrinking population affects subnational finance, public service delivery, and the multi-level governance mechanism that can help address such challenges. So our focus today is on the three years project, Shrinking Smartly and Sustainably, which will focus on regions experiencing strong and sustained population decline in OECD member and accession countries. So my colleague Anna will be presenting uh, the project in more detail in, in, a, in a minute. I just want to, to insist on the fact that this project is really comprehensive, multifaceted. Uh, it will focus on the implication of shrinking in a wide range of policy areas economic development, public finance, multi-level governance, infrastructure, and so on. It will aim at delivering new data for EU and OECD countries, specific case studies with targeted recommendations, as well as guidelines for policymakers and a compendium of good practices to help regions manage demographic change in a smart way. So Anna will tell you more in a, in a minute. Uh, thank you again very much to all. Thank you to the commission. And I look forward to advancing this, this work with all of you and to hearing your insights from today's discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dorothe, for your introductory remarks. Um, I am now pleased to give the floor to Anna Wagner, uh, head of the Policy De Development and Economic Analysis Unit at the Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy at the European Commission, who will also provide some welcome remarks. Ms. Wagner, the floor is yours. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all, and, and thanks um, a lot for, for this opportunity and also Thanks to Dorote for uh, sketching out um, basically the context um, which gives the background um, of, of this project. And, uh, and I really don't think that it makes sense for me now to um, evoke uh, after her um, the, the, the different trends um, in detail um, that represent the overall tendency um, that we now perceive to be um, a demographic challenge for um, well, uh, European regions and many other regions, uh, of course, worldwide. But I mean, if one thinks really about the fact that basically one in three people currently live in a region with a shrinking population, and if we consider that it's three out of five people, um, if we consider rural regions, um, then we clearly realize that this is um, a challenge that will affect um, at a massive scale European regions. Um, and of course, I'm talking about, about Europe because this is, this is our business. And in particular, this is our business to um, find ways for our regions, for European regions to, um, first of all, make sure that the problem and the tendencies are well understood which always goes through examples and and analytics because because facts talk um, but also to give some sort of i wouldn't call them recipes because we are far away from that at this stage but some hints um, some ways forward that help in thinking about uh, how to overcome this problem. And in particular, what, what we have here, um, according to our understanding or my understanding, is three sort of, of drivers um, that um, determine the population decline that will, that will hit us um, in the coming years, already in the coming decade. And that is something that cannot uh, be like reversed, but what needs to be lived with and to what we need to be adapted to. Um, and especially we need to be adapted to this if we are um, regions that um, are uh, in a situation um, who, who want to um, improve resilience and, and overcome in a successful way uh, the challenges. So basically we have an aging population um, the increase of the, the population that is aged 65 and over. We also have um, a, a working age population that is projected to shrink in Europe. And we also have the number of school age children declining. And basically these three factors um, already um, determine to a large extent the, the consequences or the corresponding elements um, that regions need to prepare for. Um, obviously, this, this, is, this leads to a different needs in terms of service provision, in terms of infrastructure, and basically a, a different challenge for the built environment. Obviously, for aging, one needs more elderly care services, but also aging will remind us or re Make, make us realize that, that the long-term financial sustainability of the welfare state that we know um, is at risk. Obviously, the per capita burden per pub public debt will also increase if we have a shrinking working age population, not talking obvi obviously about other pressures that are put on the, on the labor market. And when we are talking about these challenges, the, the ultimate difficulty and the ultimate risk that we have is um, a worsened economic, regional and social divide um, in our territories. And this is exactly something that regional policy and cohesion policy is there to, to bridge or to enhance or to, um, to um, uh, mitigate. Um, and basically, 
because this natural demographic change is not something that that will change, uh, but it's a tendency that we need to live with. Um, the key word for me um, is basically adaptation. Um, Dorote was mentioning basically the, the need for having long-term strategies. And obviously to be able to, to build those strategies, uh, one needs to have some examples and, um, and, and, and actions that can serve as an inspiration, um, study cases, um, good policy responses and practices that are shared so that um, decision makers would have an appropriate uh, basis to be able to um, to be able to sorry to be able to um, 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 get their get their strategies um, based on and and that's something um, which we hope this project will contribute to um, and that it will contribute in a way that it really takes into account the most important single thing that we have under um, cohesion policy principle is the recognition of the difference of regions, meaning that we are not further away with one size fits all solutions, but we need a multitude of solutions and multitude of cases and multitude of actions so that there is a possibility for every region to pick a mix or to inspire, be inspired from examples that fit that region. Um, ultimately, this work pretty much contributes to um, our thinking now regarding the, the future of the policy. Um, we are in the process of thinking through uh, the challenges, the mechanics and the way forward for post-2027. And the key word for us um, in the, the current context to, to help build resilience of regions. And for me, the work stream that is engaged here including um, the experience um, that um, is going to be out there um, in countries like Japan or um, the USA or, or Canada who have all different sorts of, of challenges but that are ultimately pretty much linked to our um, demographic uh, challenges. For me, um, this demographic um, challenges strand of work fits very well into the rest of the challenges on which um, we are embarking uh, through other work streams um, in, in my unit and, and in the in the director general which are linked to the green and digital transition challenges the skills challenges so for me this demographic uh, work strand is something which is going to come very high on the agenda uh, of our uh, thinking and political ambition when it comes to to um, building the, the resilience of, of, of European regions. And therefore, I'm very happy to, to have the opportunity to participate in this kickoff event of, of this project. And we look forward to the valuable insights that you are going to uh, share with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wagner, for your introductory remarks. Uh, I think together with those of Dorothée and with the facts, the drivers and the challenges that you alluded to, I think we can now see much more clearly why the topic of adapting to shrinkage, so uh, shrinking smartly and sustainably, is, is relevant for us today. And I'm sure we will talk a lot about these issues later in our panel. So this logically leads us to, to wonder, what is this project precisely going to be about? What are we going to do in the framework of this project? And to explain this, I am pleased to turn to Ana Moreno, Program Manager of Regional Inequalities and Demographic Change at the Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division at the OECD, who will give us a snapshot of what the project will be about. Ana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mikel, for that introduction. So in this presentation, I will outline the background and motivation for our project and provide you with an overview of the project components, the deliverables, and the timeline. Next, please. So as you've heard, population shrinking, as we understand it in this project, refers to a sustained and strong decline in population levels. This decline is the result of fertility, mortality, and migration rates, all of which are in turn influenced by the current population age structure. 
So in many shrinking regions, our migrations, our migration flows have actually stabilized, but past our migration translating to a relatively large share of all population today. So it comes as no surprise then that most shrinking regions in, in OECD countries are also experiencing aging. This means that the effect of fertility in reversing population trends is very limited. So reversing the inertia of population structures requires then very large inflows of people in, retro in reproductive age, as you will hear in a moment from our first panel speaker. As a consequence, uh, it is likely that shrinking regions will continue to shrink in the next decades. Shrinking is not, however, an impediment to have thriving communities with high levels of well-being. It does require those sound policy interventions because population change, meaning the change in the scale and composition of the population, comes with at least three effects. First, it causes changing, changes in the demand for services, for instance, less demand for education and higher demand for care, as well as higher cost of provision per person as scale economies become lower. Second, it causes mismatches between the infrastructure and housing that is in place and the one that is needed to satisfy the demands of current and future populations. And third, it causes more sparsity which means less services, services and amenities at close proximity from where people live and longer journeys to access all kinds of services. At the same time, as you will hear from our second panelist, shrinking regions face several challenges that can lead to the under provision of public goods and services, including smaller tax bases, shortages of service professionals, low capital investment and maintenance, pressure from broader service rationing and poorer connectivity. Next, please. So these effects mean policies need to intervene in the adaptation of several areas at the same time, including housing, infrastructure, the living environment, and service provision. Interventions that happen in isolation or in an uncoordinated manner risk losing any positive impact, as you will hear from our third panelist. For instance, interventions that focus only on maintenance existing infrastructure could, could miss opportunities to make settlements more compact to increase, for instance, walkability and attractiveness. At the same time, not all interventions happen at the same scale or are the responsibility of the same level of government. For instance, the reorganization of more specialized services such as hospitals and higher education is usually made at the regional level but it obviously affects the prospects of local communities. For local services where small scale and staff shortages are an issue, service provision could be best organized in functional areas, for instance, group of proximate rural municipalities. In the case of towns and cities, the right scale would consider the impact of interventions in city centers and their suburban areas together, as we will hear from our fourth panelists today. The project will thus consider three main interrelated areas of action. The first is multi-level governance and service delivery. The second is spatial planning, which includes land use, housing, infrastructure, and the environment. And the third one is urban policies specifically tailored to shrinking. Next, please. I now turn to the description of the project and the timeline of activities. So this is a 36 month project that is organized around two pillars, an analytical pillar and a policy pillar. The analytical pillar aims to provide international comparable indicators on three fronts. First, on the drivers behind population shrinking. Second, on the adaptation of settlements to new population scales, including land use, the built environment, infrastructure, housing, and public services. And the third and very important one is of national indicators relevant to population and shrinkage that will draw from existing and new data on subnational governance and fiscal. This pillar will deliver, besides indicators and data, a technical paper on demographic scenarios that will draw from analysis of newly available data at the grid, regional, and local levels. On the other hand, the policy pillar that will run in parallel to the analytical pillar will combine cross-country and case study data to analyze two main questions. The first one is the existence and adequacy of plans to adapt to shrinkage and the coherence of spatial planning frameworks in OECD countries. The second is the relationship between depopulation and shrinking and fiscal sustainability at both the regional and local levels. 
As part of this pillar, we will establish a consultation group on population decline that will com be composed of academic experts, policymakers, and representatives of local and regional governments that will provide expert advice throughout the project. We will also have three peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and three country case studies, one for each of the thematic areas of the project. We will produce a working paper with a policy framework covering all the relevant areas of the project and their interconnections, as well as a compendium of policy of good practices to manage population decline and a set of guidelines for the multi-level governance of demographic change. A synthesis report at the end will bring these elements together. So with this, I close my presentation and I welcome any questions during the Q&A. And for now, back to you, Mikel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, for this illustrative overview of both the project, but of course also on the subject matter of shrinkage. Indeed, I think it's a project with different pillars touching upon different but also connected thematic areas related to the phenomenon of regional uh, shrinkage. So in order to touch upon each of the main topics of this project, I am now pleased to open a, a panel discussion with four expert panelists who have very kindly accepted to talk and present their views on their areas of expertise here today. So on behalf of the organizing team, thank you very much uh, for being here. Each of you will talk for about 10 minutes and we will later have time for questions and answers from the audience. So please, to all of those listening to us, uh, feel free to ask your questions as we go. And if time allows, we will make sure that we ask them to the relevant panelists. So without further ado, uh, let me turn to the first panelist today. Um, Alberto Esteva, thanks very much for being with us. Um, you are professor at the Department of Sociology of the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain, and you are also the director of the Demographic Studies Center. So as an expert in demography and demographic project, uh, prospects, I think you are in a great position to talk to us about uh, the demographic prospects for the populating areas. So Albert, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. You should, yeah, okay. Right so, now, perfect. Uh, thank you. Buenos dias. So, are you seeing the slides? Yes, yes, ah, we are. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Miguel and Anna, for inviting me to participate in this um, uh, kickoff uh, meeting of this uh, very relevant uh, project that you're planning to implement in the next three years. Uh, I was invited to give some sort of an, a demographic overview, uh, talk about the demographic change. And I now realize that uh, perhaps I, uh, the, the first message I, I wanted to give you, you already know it because uh, uh, that, that I, had, I had organized. So I'm organizing my, my, my talk in two messages. I'm not going to talk about the economy. I'm not going to talk about the social consequences of the population. I'll try to make it a very demographic talk, OK? And, uh, but it seems that you are already convinced, at least uh, hearing Anna's and Dorothy's uh, presentations, that this is um, the only thing we can do is uh, adapt or, uh, or try to manage this the population or this shrinking of the population as, as, as good as possible. But that there's no way that we can stop uh, this process. No? So uh, I'm going to use my 10 minutes just to illustrate with some real data about the magnitude of the demographic change that is going on and what we can expect in the next uh, decades. OK, so the first message is this depopulation or the, the population decline is something we cannot uh, 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 fix, so it's not something we cannot stop for most of the areas that are now going through this uh, process. And this is uh, very easy to understand uh, why this is not possible, because as we uh, have a population that for a long period of time has below replacement fertility, that means uh, on average 2.1 children per woman, and they society or this territory doesn't receive a lot of migrants uh, from other uh, regions. So sooner or later, the population starts aging and aging and aging, which means that the share of all population out of the total population is increasing. And then in the long run, 
this uh, uh, produces uh, population decline. So probably this is going to happen. The world is going to experience this in 70, 80 years from now. But there are some regions in this planet that they are already facing this, this situation. And then the second uh, thing that happens is that when we have this process of aging, then the share of women in reproductive ages, it, 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 it shrinks. So we don't have a lot of candidates to become parents, okay? And then this is a second, a second, a second uh, moment in this in this transition. So we keep aging. Then the share of the reproductive age population is going down. And therefore, even even if this few uh, uh, or the I believe we have lost Albert. We will wait for a moment if he comes back. Apologies for this. Happening in, in many regions in Spain. Spain no? So um, in order, and this is pure mathematics, uh, that in order to keep the population stable in the long run, mid or long run, we need a 2.1 two, 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 uh, uh, children per woman. And that's, uh, we can get to 2.07, but it's, in the long run, this is what it's needed to keep the population uh, stable. What we know is that there's no OCD country with a, probably a, a fertility at this level or above. All of the countries are clearly below this threshold. And the only reason we have seen some countries that are not experiencing a population decline despite having very low levels of fertility is because uh, they have received a lot of international migration. It's, it's a paradox so that there are, in Spain, for instance, we have more population than ever, but there are regions that have the lowest population ever recorded in the last hundred years, okay? And the reason is that when these international migrants come to some OCD countries, they do not spread evenly and they try to concentrate in some areas. And then the metropolitan areas, the urban areas, they get a lot of uh, migrants, but then there's more uh, isolated or internal areas, they don't get migrants. Therefore, that kind of accelerates uh, a little bit the, the population decline. No? And then there's another factor that there's the international migration. So people move from one area to the other. I think, uh, at least in Spain, there is this uh, uh, false impression that the reason why some of these areas are depopulating is because the young people are living. And this is true, but the main reason is because the old people are dying. And that's, that's, uh, that's I will try to show it to you now in a minute. No? So they, they left many decades ago. <laughs> and they some sort of left uh, the, all these populations that were already um, there was some sort of a clock that will produce this population decline in the long run uh, 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 because of, of this uh, migration that happens many decades ago. And now low fertility, no international migration plus uh, migration that took place decades ago. It's some sort of the combination, the cocktail that is now producing this trend. You know? So uh, let me let me give you some numbers. Uh, um, in this is the map of Spain, and this area here is Castilla y León, which is the one that has the highest number of municipalities that they are losing population uh, at a very rapid speed. is one of the most depopulated areas, and where you can see that it has also the largest proportions of people aged. 65 plus. Uh, so there are municipalities with more than 60% of the population is over 65 uh, plus, okay? What we did with my colleagues here at the Center for Demographic Studies is what's gonna happen to these municipalities that are in Castilla León in the next three, four decades, you know? And in Castilla León, uh, we have 1800 municipalities with less than 500 inhabitants. The average population of these municipalities is 162 inhabitants. The average age of the population is 56 years old. The proportion of population with 65 plus is 38%. In all these municipalities, by 2020, there was a total population of almost 300 inhabitants living in, in, in these 500, in these 1800 municipalities. But only five years ago, 
there were 323,000, which means that in a very short period of five years, they have lost 30,000 inhabitants, all these 18 uh, municipalities. We can somehow decompose this uh, decline and we can say that 73% of this decline, it's all more than 20,000 persons, it's because they died. And then 27% is because they left. Okay, so the, the, the major driver of this population decline is uh, uh, mortality. So what's going to happen in the next uh, 18 years if the trends continues the same? So we are predicting that by 2040, it's going to be 212,000, uh, which means 80,000 less than what we have nowadays. Right? But why keeping the fertility constant, keeping the migration, and most of them, 76,000 out of 80,000 is going to be because they will be a time. Mm -hmm. So the, we, have a, we have an age, a very aged societies, and then it's very difficult to reverse that because we have not yet invented immortality. Um, so that's, uh, and then there's something we, we decided to do with my friends here at Center. It say, why if we make this miracle, that all women in these municipalities have the desired number of children, like 2.1 children per woman over the life course. So we have realized that because of the age sex structure of these uh, populations is very, very old. Even with this scenario, with the women who live in those areas have 2.1 children, the population will continue to decline for 70 years. So we have 70 years of population decline guaranteed, even with a miracle uh, or a miraculous recovery of fertility. Okay, and the population will stabilize at 133,000, which is 45% of its current size. Okay, so there's some sort of inertia. There's a, there's a population structure that now is designed to decline because in order to uh, uh, grow, we need young population that can uh, reproduce. So the second message, and I don't know, uh, do I have a minute or, or, or I'm, I'm out of uh, time? Yeah, let's take two minutes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so this, this, they are, see, we should help our politicians to remeasure age, age the population. No? And the idea is, Let's make sure we know how to differentiate the natural component and the migration component. We know that immortality is not an option, so we should target those young populations. Why stay? Why do they? some of them, they leave? They target young populations, provide incentives to remain there and have families, but as, knowing that this is not going to have an effect in the long, in the medium and short run. Set net new population targets. We know that some population has to disappear because they're very old and they will die sooner or later. So it's impossible to reverse that. But also to try to be more creative in our way of measuring the population and use this idea of the temporary use of a space. Because also I'm a little bit critical of how we are measuring this. We are basing measuring this based on legal residence. And I don't know whether this is good enough to capture this temporal use of the territory because I know that some areas are depopulated during the labor, so, so from Monday to, to Friday, and then they are full of people in, in during the weekend. So I think uh, perhaps one way of softening a little bit this effect is by by spreading our time or our the, 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 the where we live over more locations over uh, the year. And I, I'm gonna stop here because I don't wanna take more time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. This was a very clear presentation. I think you touched upon many interesting points and I'm sure that this will spark debate across our audience, but also beyond. Um, among others, I noticed, for example, that you mentioned the, the sheer magnitude of the demographic change that we are witnessing, uh, but also the 
uh, irreversibility of population decline, right? Especially in some EU regions, uh, both to due to aging and the share of reproductive uh, population, and also the fact that no OECD country is safe from the, this phenomenon. So uh, measuring the population accurately is, is, is crucial because it's happening and, and it's something that I think we will be mulling over in the framework of this project. I also noted the example of Castilla Leon, um, and I noted specifically that the average population size of, of, of the municipalities is only 162. Um, so of course this poses uh, a question of service delivery and uh, the multi-level governance arrangements. So I think this leads me logically uh, to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Josefina Sisna is a professor at Linköping University in Sweden. Josefina will be answering your questions once we get to the Q&A, but she is unable to join us at this time. So instead, um, she has kindly sent a recording where she discusses multi-level governance and service provision in the populating areas. So let's watch it. We seem to have a bit of a problem with the sound. Co colleagues try to. Mark, maybe if you unmute yourself. Yeah. Like no. Let's uh, yes. move to the next speaker, Mikhail, okay. while we check this on the background. Okay, apologies for, for this. Um, we will come back to, to this video uh, after the next speaker. So let me turn now uh, to what was to be the third panelist, um, Mr. Tid Oytjarv. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, you are a consulting manager at uh, Ernest & Young in Estonia and you will be sharing your perspective and expertise in the fields of spatial planning, land use, housing, um, and environment in the context of uh, regional shrinkage. Um, you also previously were, uh, were the head of spatial planning um, at the department, um, sorry, the head of the spatial planning department in the Ministry of Finance in Estonia. So I think uh, it's it's very suitable for, for, you, for us to have you here. And so thank you very much. The floor is yours for 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's really a hot topic for us uh, here in Estonia as well. Uh, so, yes, I will be primarily utilizing my previous experience uh, from the spatial planning field. Now, now I'm in a bit of a dis different position at the consultancy, but uh, still the issue is very close to me. Um, uh, and uh, just uh, perhaps a brief uh, insight from the spatial planning or land use planning uh, point of view. Uh, and I enriched uh, this presentation with some uh, Estonian example as well. Uh, so perhaps it's uh, then a little bit more tangible and, and interesting for you. And I'll, I would also actually take uh, take the chance and uh, thank Anna-Marie and, um, and, and others uh, for working with us uh, in, Est in Estonia with, uh, with the same topic. It was uh, really an interesting and, and very fruitful uh, cooperation uh, and then the recommendations you gave uh, have been partly already, already applied so perhaps i will give some examples as well i hope my screen sharing is okay because i only see part of my slides but i hope you can you see, see it perfectly Thank okay you. great yeah okay so just uh, just to show you that uh, in Estonia, being a small country, also we we know we know the topic uh, all too well. Uh, our population has been changing over the years, over the decades, of course. Uh, as you see on the left side, uh, it has been actually growing a little uh, since the past few years uh, due to immigration. Of course, the fertility rates are are devastating, as in in many many countries. Uh, but uh, what is, uh, I think, striking is, is the right-hand uh, figure uh, is, uh, is the projection uh, by counties. So Estonia has 15 counties. And then during the few 
upcoming decades, uh, some of them are expected to lose a third of, of the total population and only two regions, which is Hario County, which is the where our capital is situated and another one is, is expected to grow. So it is something that we feel every day, uh, the shrinking issue and trying to find solutions. Uh, and just another background slide, uh, sorry, the text is quite small, but uh, uh, so what it represents is the share of, of empty dwellings uh, in Estonia, uh, which can be up to 50% in some areas. So um, this is, the data is a bit debatable. Uh, it's a recent uh, population and uh, housing census data, but it was partly register praise, uh, based, uh, not uh, not as a survey. So so there might be some tendencies here, but, but still, um, it can easily be uh, up to a third or uh, two thirds, even uh, in some areas, uh, empty dwellings. So it is all too relevant for us as well. Uh, but there are some uh, ongoing um, initiatives or uh, or things that we are doing in Estonia, and then perhaps it's a nice intro to to the spatial planning side of it. Uh, so. What Estonia is is still in the process of doing is is developing a strategy. So, firstly, just uh, saying it out loud and 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 reflecting it in, in strategic documents that uh, spatial planning uh, or shrinking is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, there is currently no strategic vision uh, on how to deal with it, and uh, it has not actually been mentioned as a goal or, or as a, a problem on the national level nor in many places and on the local level as well so this is something that uh, this is a very first stage uh, but uh, something we are all, only taking now although we have seen the problem arising or, or building up uh, over the few decades uh, already uh, nevertheless uh, there are some pilots already uh, that have been going on both on, on the municipalities uh, side and also been supported by the uh, central government. Uh, but uh, I would say these are rather uh, pilots and then just supporting the demolishing of, of empty buildings. Uh, although there are some initiatives also try, uh, to try to uh, come up with innovative uh, service provision ways uh, in rural areas, but uh, but this has been rather scattered in my mind and um, of course the, the pilot uh, has been going well uh, there have been there has been support uh, in actually taking down empty buildings and uh, apartment buildings but also supporting the local municipalities with operational issues and uh, and actually legal legal guideline, guidelines as well because uh, there might be different issues on uh, Related to to getting the half apartment, half empty apartment buildings actually absolutely empty. Uh, for instance, uh, some of the apartments belonging to uh, Russian Federation uh, nationals who who are unreachable, and then what to do in those cases. So that they are actually really practical problems that uh, the municipalities have to deal with if they really take it on. And um, there are also some examples uh, of a really spatial approach uh, because I'm, I personally wouldn't call this uh, demolishing the most critical houses um, a spatial solution to, to, to the shrinkage problem. It is, it is only dealing with uh, very, uh, let's say, the most visible and, and uh, burning topic uh, that is related to, to, to the shrinkage issue. Uh, but there are some, also in Estonia, some examples of uh, where, like, um, let's say, holistic spatial vision or spatial planning approach has been tried. Uh, there's one example from from Narva, which is quite close to to the Russian border, um, which one of the quite rapidly shrinking areas. Uh, they are drafting a new comprehensive plan, a land use plan. Uh, and uh, the green area on the on the scheme is, is something they in the future see as um, an area that will be redesigned. Uh, in other words, uh, perhaps be be given back to the nature in in a few years. So I think this is one of the few examples where uh, 
the local municipality has actually starting uh, started pronouncing uh, this vision of, of, of narrowing narrowing down the, the built environment. Uh, but uh, what I think is uh, really quite uh, substantial uh, as, a, as a requirement when when dealing with uh, with shrinkage is is to to move more towards uh, like a comprehensive spatial approach uh, what I see in Estonia and I, I know is the issue also in many other countries is we are quite good at to doing land use planning we we know how to set land use planning regulations uh, building codes uh, how to control whether these have been implemented and so on but at least in Estonia and then some of the other countries I'm more familiar with uh, uh, really applying spatial planning as such uh, is something we are still learning and then by by spatial planning I mean um, more creating a spatial vision and uh, trying to implement various policy uh, policy instruments to to get the, to this uh, subsidies uh, in areas where we want to invest first and uh, and and so on so i think without these more diverse uh, set of, of policy instruments uh, it is very hard to manage also spatially uh, the shrinking issue because it is something that uh, we probably will be living with uh, for the next uh, couple of decades uh, and uh, also what uh, a more like uh, spatial planning like of uh, approach would enable us is to involve different stakeholders and then to form uh, coalitions with uh, with the private and public sector to to really create approaches that uh, tackle this from 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 different angles because uh, uh, land use planning as we've used to it is is more like a government uh, local government or central government uh, driven instrument that doesn't seem to be working uh, when, when managing complex problems And then just to conclude, I think this is my last slide. Uh, uh, a few reflections, uh, what I see based on Estonia, uh, now that uh, I've, I've left the public sector and then looking at things uh, from aside a little. Uh, shrinking as such is, is still a very, very sensitive issue politically. Uh, especially it seems to be the case on, on the local municipality level or the local level uh, pronouncing that uh, we are actually shrinking and we need to deal with it uh, is is something that many many local politi politicians still uh, don't um, are not willing to to say out loud uh, and this might even be easier to be done on the national level uh, saying that this is an an issue that we need to be dealing with uh, on all on the governance levels, um, be it uh, two or three or four governance levels. So uh, giving a national like uh, direction to to this uh, problem might also support uh, actually finding solutions on the local level. And the second thing that we see or, or uh, is, has become very evident in Estonia is that uh, once the problems actually start uh, affecting the local life, uh, then that seems to be when things are actually starting to happen. Uh, if, uh, if it really is affecting the local budget so much that you need to change something, then that is, that is when actually something is being done. It is quite easy to postpone this problem up to that time. But of course, uh, on all governance level, at least in Estonia, we do see that uh, the capacity of, uh, of, of the public servants, uh, just, just the number of them or also the knowledge and know-how is, is still very low. Uh, so that is something that needs to be built on both on the national level and on the local level. We don't have regional governance in Estonia, so, so that's not an, an issue for us anymore. And uh, it seems that uh, it is quite easy to to 
like do a demolition projects. Of course, it's not easy. It is it is very complex and and challenging. But uh, but I, I definitely see that um, to to actually try to gain something out of it to create a better living environment to to get to the, like savings on on maintaining the technical infrastructure there needs to be a spatial vision that is um, like cross cross sectors and 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 more more long term so that is something that we have not at least in estonia come to yet i think not uh, not on the national nor the local level okay. And uh, yeah, so just to figure as well. So, as as with many problems, this is a very simply simplified uh, model of, of problem solving or or trying to steer uh, the society towards something. Is but it it has been described that uh, uh, at first uh, nobody knows of the problem, nobody talks of it, and then nobody knows that it, it, it even exists. Uh, then people start talking about it, and and uh, and you start uh, doing first uh, pilots, and 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 somebody does does something already. And but what we should get to is that um, we don't necessarily talk about it uh, too much anymore. Uh, it, it it has become a part of the normal. You just deal with it. Uh, and um, I think that is now already happening with uh, sustainable development or, or different, uh, those kinds of topics, but uh, shrinkage is something we are definitely, at least in Estonia, quite in an early phase. Uh, it's something we're only starting to talk about and even some some on the political level and, and also in other instances, uh, people are saying that it's not an issue we can reverse it uh, it's not happening so i think we are as as at least in estonia we are, as a society we are quite early on in the process of actually tackling it yeah but that's it for me thank you very much thank you so very much Tiet, for this very clear presentation i mean some people may have stopped talking about shrink but most certainly the OECD and the European Commission will not, uh, and certainly for the upcoming months and years to come. So thank you very much. I think you made very interesting points. For example, I, I remember the fact that the, 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 the statistic about uh, most counties which are um, about to lose a third of the population, um, which again points to the, re to the relevance of, of shrinkage. And I think there's a lot to learn from, from Estonia, and this is something that we will do in the project. Um, from other countries and for example learning from the first examples of what you called uh, holistic or and comprehensive spatial planning approaches uh, with diverse policy instruments in contrast to land use planning as we know it today and also one important point that i noted is the the the, the fact that there is a need for strategic vision towards uh, shrinking which meaningfully involves all stakeholders right which may not always be there uh, due to different reasons and politics may be uh, as you mentioned a very important variable to account for in this in these calculations so these are the topics actually that uh, Josefina would also talk about in uh, her video so let's try to play it again good afternoon everybody and uh... Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give you this presentation at the kickoff meeting here today. Uh, my name is Josefina Sysner. I'm professor in human geography at Linköping University in Sweden and also guest professor in public administration at Gothenburg University. And I will talk today about multi-level governance and service provision in depopulating areas. So all of us in this uh, meeting, we know both from previous presentations today and also from before that uh, the question of depopulation and demographic decline is a matter of fact in great parts of, the, of Europe and of other uh, continents in the world. And I will talk a bit about what consequences does this give and how can these consequences be governed and met with within the multi-level governance system and I will focus primarily on the issue of service provision and um, if we just talk a little bit about the consequences of depopulation many studies have observed that um, one of the most palpable um, effects uh, is that the physical infrastructure tends to be oversized. There is an excess of housing, houses, industrial buildings, um, um, 
water and sewage structure is, is, is oversized and tends to be very costly. We also know that the tax revenues tend to be limited in the depopulating areas due to um, um, a smaller workforce. We know that the per capita expenditures for social services rise because there are less people sharing the costs for the social services. We know from several studies that it could be hard, it could be challenging for public sectors to actually uh, recruit workforces for welfare services because the labour market might be more um, rewarding for people in the urban, in the dense urban areas. We also know from our previous studies that depopulation has implications for politics, for legitimacy and for democracy in the depopulating uh, areas. Um, the question then is, for whom are these issues to handle? Who should sort of uh, take responsibility for these issues? And I would say that we can start with asking if there is a, some kind of welfare negotiation, a welfare contract between uh, the citizens, the individuals, and the public authorities. Is there a promise being made by the public to provide services, et cetera, for uh, the individual citizens? If this is the case, well, then, demographic decline and depopulation is very much an issue that public authorities need to handle. The question is then for, for what parts of, of the public sector is depopulation an issue? And I would say that the multi-level governance system and arrangements, they work differently in different contexts and different issues and responsibilities are organized differently in different contexts. We also know uh, that um, network governance work differently in different contexts. In some areas, in some countries, uh, welfare provision is very much um, uh, a responsibility for the public sector. In other parts of the world, this is very much an issue that is solved in collaboration between public uh, authorities, private actors and the civil society. So we should know that the multi-level arrangements look differently in our different contexts. And we also know that the uh, shape of the network governance look differently. Uh, when we talk about what implications demographic decline have for local governments, we should keep in mind that politics, no matter what scale we talk about, it concerns the right to distribute values in society. And local politics, as much as regional or state politics, is about deciding who gets what, when and how. And this means that in times of scarcity, in situations where we have a scarcity of resources, as we have in those depopulating areas, politics turns out to be very, very important. This question on, or on how those limited scarce resources should be distributed, what groups should get what, why should they get it and how should they get the support, this is a super relevant and very, very urgent uh, question to discuss in many depopulating uh, areas. Uh, but in our research, we have asked how do local governments handle this situation of scarcity? How do they handle the uh, negotiations and the situations they end up in? And in our studies in Sweden, as well as in many other parts of the world, we have observed that um, local governments tend not to talk about this scarcity to the extent that they should. Rather, they tend to have a focus on growth. Growth, local growth in terms of, of population growth or economic growth has very much been the primary goal in local policy and planning. It is also, it's a, it is also a very well-known fact that in those areas that face demographic decline, decline or shrinkage has been very, very much disregarded in the public debate. We know from our studies in Sweden that local governments, they do take action to handle the consequences of the population that I talked about, uh, an excess of infrastructure, um, lowering, uh, lower taxes, um, um, higher um, expenditures per capita for social services, et cetera. But these actions are ad hoc uh, uh, rather than um, strategic and rather than being part of a long-term plan. Uh, the results of the growth focus in local policy is not growth because uh, the absence of growth and the presence of demographic decline is a result of changes on a macro level. And it's very hard for local governments to actually uh, manage to change this trend and to, to um, uh, produce growth uh, in a context of decline. So the result of the growth policy at local levels is not growth but what we call mismanaged shrinkage. 
And this is a critique that we have uh, from our studies in Sweden, but it's also a main critique uh, within the field of shrinking geographies. And I have colleagues in, in, in Canada, in Northern America, um, in other parts of Europe, in Australia, etc., that has focused and, and that ha who have made this observation. Um, the focus on growth in local policy do not lead to growth, but to mismanaged shrinkage. And what I, together with others, then request is an explicit local adaptation policy. That is a policy that tells the citizens how local governments are um, want to handle depopulation. And just to give you um, an image of or, or an idea of what this is, when we talk about growth policy in local government context, we talk about measures such as stimulating entrepreneurship, investments, business climate, and so forth. And the growth policy, it aims at creating supply and demand at local levels. It aims at creating growth and a more diversified local labor market. And local governments that we interview, they hope that this will result in better preconditions for uh, welfare services in all parts of the municipality. So this is, so to say, the policy theory of growth policy. But what I would, li what, what I would like to introduce is another idea, namely then the local adaptation policy. And in local adaptation policy, we have other kinds of measures that could be intermunicipal collaboration, it could be um, uh, multi level collaboration, it could be cooperation with the civil society, it could be um, increased taxes, it could also be concentrations and budget cuts. Quite often, that has to take place in those areas. And those measures, they aim at adapting the municipal services and the organization to current and coming demographic conditions. And the hope uh, with local adaptation policy is that it would be that it would result in an economy imbalance in those lo local governments that are declining, but also uh, good quality in welfare services, despite those shrinking resources. And it could also result in transparency and in intermunicipal learning. So one of my messages here today is that growth policy and adaptation policy are two separate um, policy fields. But of course, in the best of worlds, local governments manage to uh, go both for growth policy and for adaptation policy. And, and in the best of worlds, they manage to um, um, integrate them and to make these two different policy areas support each other. Uh, we have made interviews in Sweden where we have asked, uh, asked our informants about how do they try to adapt um, the local government, um, both in terms of its organization and in terms of its services it's provide. How do they adapt to demographic change? And uh, in our interviews, we uh, observe that the local governments, they have both sold and deconstructed uh, buildings that are not uh, anymore in use. They also tell us that they stop providing uh, some certain services to the uh, citizens. They also talk about civil society cooperation as a very important policy measure. Uh, every municipality we have visited have talked about uh, that they have increased the taxes. Nobody uh, are in favor of this. Everybody would have liked to uh, decrease and lower the taxes if they could, but uh, all of them have used the, uh, the possibility of, of increasing taxes in order to increase their incomes. Uh, many of them talk about intermunicipal cooperation as a means to solve uh, welfare services in a more cost efficient way. Many of them, many of our informants also talk about the need to be more innovative in their welfare production. And this is, uh, I would say, an under um, researched and an under investigated uh, field. How could we be more innovative when it comes to welfare production? And the question, of course, is if if this adaptation could be done in a more democratic, sustainable and well informed and well informed way, because none of the municipalities that we have visited can provide us with a program or a strategy where they uh, describe what different measures they have uh, made. Uh, this is, so to say, our um, reconstruction of the interviews that we have made with the informants. It is not um, um, a structured plan or a strategy that they provide us with. Um, when we talk about local adaptation policy, it is very important to um, be honest and transparent with the fact that limited resources and um, adaptation will lead to um, priorities, and it will need to, it, and it will lead to a variety of conflicts that local governments need to handle. One um, potential conflict is the conflict between different interest groups. 
It could be elder people against families. It could be youngsters against um, adults. Uh, it could be different groups with different needs that try to uh, get as most as they, they can um, for their interests. Uh, it could also be, okay, of course, uh, a conflict of locations, especially in a geography where you have huge land areas that are very sparsely populated. Then the, it, it could, of course, be a conflict about where the services should be provided. Another conflict that is obvious is uh, the, the conflict around values. What is the most important thing for the local uh, government to, to achieve? Is it cost efficiency? Is it quality in their services? Or is it availability? Especially the, the conflict between quality and availability is something that many local governments need to handle. And it's very important for every local government to face those conflicts, not to pretend that these conflicts are not at hand, because these are conflicts that every um, local government that adapt their services to a changing demography need to handle. So my advice would be to make these conflicts explicit and to uh, make them public and to have an open discussion about how to, to cope with and how to deal with and how to orientate yourself uh, when it comes to these conflicting interests, locations and values. Um, I would also like to, to stress that policy development, local adaptation policy development and policy learning and policy evaluation, it could be supported at, at all levels of government. Um, I've, I spoke mostly about local levels of government today because that is a very relevant um, level of government in Sweden when it comes to demographic adaptation. But um, the support to policy development and policy learning, it could be supported, as I said, at all levels of government. Um, ideally, I would say that um, actors at various levels, subnational, local, regional, national levels, would coordinate themselves to address those challenges that come with the demographic decline. And uh, it would be so uh, beneficial if local, regional and state governments could coordinate themselves and to gain a joint understanding of what is needed in order to adapt uh, a place to a new demographic situation. Ideally, actors from different sectors, from private sectors, civil society and public sectors, also coordinate themselves horizontally to develop policies for demographic adaptation. Uh, lastly, I would just give you uh, a hint about a publication that I published at Springer's uh, a few years ago. It's called Pathways to Demographic Adaptation. And if you think that I was too quick or not clear enough in my presentation, you can find uh, most of the arguments in this publication and it's easy to find uh, online. So um, now I will stop sharing my screen with you and uh, thank you for listening. And I hope to see you in a second uh, um, on a train uh, in Norway. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to Josefina for this video. And I see that she has now joined. So Josefina, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you argued in the video that shrinkage has somewhat been disregarded to the, to the detriment of growth in local policy. And you have also said that the result of this was, and I quote, mismanaged shrinkage, right? And you have also called for the need to strategically combine local growth policies with explicit local adaptation policies to avoid precisely this mismanaged uh, shrinkage, which is which I think links with points to that were made earlier by, by Tiet. And all of these are very interesting concepts for the topic of shrinkage. And I now take the opportunity to remind the audience that the Q&A function is still open for you to ask your questions, but do it quickly because we are now over 120 participants. So it may be difficult to deal with all the questions if they come in uh, late. So do not hesitate to send them as soon as it pops up in your mind. Uh, but before opening the Q&A, uh, we should hear uh, what our next and last panelist uh, has to say. So last but not least, uh, Ms. Elisa Villares, uh, thank you very much for being with us. You are chair of the OECD Working Party on Urban Policy, and you're also head of the Division of Territorial Development and Urban Policy at the Directorate General for Territory and in Portugal. You will talk about shrinking and more precisely about shrinking of small towns and cities. So I'll give the floor to you, Eliza, for 10 minutes. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thank you, uh, first of all, for the invitation, for the kind invitation. And first, me just allow me to echo some of the words of Tilt um, and point out how words such as shrinking, declining, retraction, aging, 
are very much avoided in the political speech at local level, especially when compared with other megatrends such as climate change or digital transition. Because in the case of, of demographic shrinkage uh, and its manifestation in towns and cities, we are dealing with an issue with a strong negative uh, uh, connotation that elicits deep, strong negative emotions. So to put it bluntly, hashtag shrinking smartly will not be a winning slogan in any local elections uh, because the underlying idea is just never appealing but actually repels us to our very core, very primordially. But the very first challenge, uh, challenge in adapting cities to a declining population is to overcome this urge to avoid the issue. So I must praise uh, the, this, this OECD for this project on shrinking smartly and sustainably for taking this step. But now about Portugal um, and how our cities and towns are adapting to a shrinking population. First, some numbers, so a brief overview of, of already heard from, uh, from Albert, um, uh, some astonishing numbers on this, but about Portugal and looking at our census from 2021, we, we have roughly 10.3 million inhabitants with a slow decrease in the last decade, so uh, a little above uh, 2%, but this will accelerate over the, the next years because we already have 22% of our population uh, over the age of 65. And this has increased this proportion 20, 20 by 20% over the last decade. So it will accelerate by the reasons already explained by Albert. On the other hand, 44% of our population lives in the two metropolitan areas. And this has been only a slight increase over the last 10 years, less than 1%. And 83% live uh, in coastal areas. Eight out of 10 of our municipalities have already shrunk in population over the last 10 years. So the issue is already here, as with Estonia, very poignantly. But the issue of declining population in cities and towns bears this distinctive territorial flavor, which has already been, been mentioned um, already in, in the introduction, but very much expressed in Portugal very clearly. So first off, in every village, town, city, and metro area, Portugal is aging. Uh, two months ago, I have to say, I celebrated the 100th birthday of my grandmother-in-law. So yes, we are living longer. That is a very good thing. But we also have, have and had had uh, less children than before, as Albert has already uh, mentioned. So the elderly uh, dependency ratio is growing. And with it, increased challenge to our economy and most notably and immediately to our economy of care in a multitude of dimensions. On the other hand, the population has been moving over the last decades from rural and near, in near areas to coastal and metropolitan areas, creating a sense of territorial split between these places, coastal and inner areas. This perception has politically framed this shrinking issue very poignantly in the last decade in Portugal, leading first to a cross-ministerial task force, and then starting four years ago, to the creation of the Ministry of Territorial Cohesion, responsible namely for spatial planning and local and regional development policy. But regardless of the effective aging and declining population in most regions uh, in Portugal, only two out of seven are not uh, yet experiencing this decline, Portugal has an established network of small and medium-sized cities throughout the territory, besides the two metropolitan areas and their wider functional areas. These medium cities, as we call them, even though most of them being small in international comparison, either preeminently or in polycentric arrangements, act as functional anchors to what is often, in often cases, are or are becoming sparsely populated areas. These small and medium-sized cities, or medium cities, are acknowledged in the national and regional spatial planning policy programs and the sectorial policies for public investment and the provision of, of services of general interest. The investment decades ago in a network of universities and technical institutes assures for these cities a, a residency of highly skilled uh, labor and the inflow of uh, young students and opportunities for smart spe specializations halting what would be a faster demographic decline otherwise. 
So in regards to the strategy um, and plan to adapt, um, we've heard some very interesting views and topics addressed because this is a very complex challenge um, and to which I could establish my own parallel in Portugal. But I'd like to focus very much on spatial planning, on the tangible uh, land and landscapes and how we are planning for this adaptation. Giving note about two topics, one I think it's more obvious and the other one I think less. So the most obvious is urban development. Up until the financial crisis of 2008, uh, Portugal experienced an intensive uh, urban development, urbanization, sprawl, and new construction throughout the entire country. Since then, however, the country has geared the investment to the renewal of urban centers and the renovation of the existing building stock. This paradigmatic change in the building sector was made possible by a conjunction of actions at national level, including changes to our spatial planning law, scrapping of the category of urbanizable land in our local land use plans, and national and regional guidelines to hold sprawl, and I would say urban sprawl because it's urban rural, 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 rural sprawl in all its ways, public investment in sustainable urban development, namely urban renewal of public spaces, mobility, and environmental quality, and the creation of an investment funding instruments for private urban renewal paired with fiscal incentives for areas demarcated for urban renewal. So this was the obvious part on urban development and how we changed the paradigm. The not so obvious is about risk management. The abandonment of inner and rural areas has led to the dramatic changes in the landscape that surround our small and medium sized cities. The expansion of forest areas and decline of land with agricultural use, so the forest eggs expanded because of the abandonment of agricultural production, has been the most significant land use change in Portugal in the last decade, by far. And a clear and visible sign of the demographic decline of inner areas. So the increase in forest areas conjoined with climate change and the greater frequency of extreme weather events generates an increased vulnerability to fires and in, um, a vulnerability that does not stop at the urban rural interfaces and makes these small and medium sized cities less attractive for living. So we have a landscape transformation project, which is a strategy for forest areas highly vulnerable uh, to fires to, that aims to develop a new and resilient economy for low density rural areas that values the natural capital and seeks to co-design with the, with the property owners and producers the desirable landscape for the future. And I would like um, to, to place here a note regarding Josefina's presentations, which I really liked because uh, it echoes what is happening in Portugal. We are um, investing a lot in, in intermunicipal uh, cooperation, decentralization and deconcentration of public services. So the, the bundle of, this, of, of these measures to tackle effectively the, the, those questions that, that Josefina was, was putting, putting out regarding the, the, the provision of services of general interest. I am supposed to close up with a, with a positive note <laughs> to refer how could uh, you know our towns and cities successfully attract new population, um, namely in the face of the of the changes and opportunities of this post pandemic world. You know, have all these opportunities um, hanging around about remote working and everything. You know, and, and I've mentioned a lot national policies, but a lot comes down to the city, and the municipality, the mayor, the local elected bodies. How do they envision a city that welcomes new residents? And what is that they, they have or need to offer um, in their specific context? Um, and I would like to, um, to refer to, to here to what I think is an, it's an outstanding example in Portugal, a Portuguese city of Fundão, whose mayor is actually an OECD champion mayor. Um, a small city in an inner area that has been attracting new residents from all origins with diverse degrees and sets of skills. And I'll echo again some of the words of Tit, you know, comprehensive strategic planning, um, multi-level governance involving uh, all actors, absolutely essential. And this is what you see in this, in this city. It has a, a clear strategy, you know, to becoming a welcoming city for all, hashtag move to Fundão. 
and the strategy that is, that is uptaken by all different sectors of the municipality in different forms from the office that supports newcomers finding a home to professional schools to the migrants and refugee centers or to the experimental agricultural center to support farmers all in tune all bought in it, to the idea translating into practice. And I would like to end with a concept, a colleague from there once pitched me from Fundão, the idea of soft lending. So the city of Fundão wants new businesses, new, new residents, I, I think all cities <laughs> do, but the support it gives, it's focused on the person on, and on the families, not, not so much the companies. They help you, they help you find a, a house to rent. The city has rented many of the available houses for that, to contract utilities, enlist your kids in school, everything you, you feel uh, you need to, to, to feel welcomed in the city, you know, with a soft landing, as I say. So this, the, this city, very renowned for, for, the, for the rank sherry and cheese, benefits from having good train connections to Lisbon and Porto, which is absolutely key for their success, while being surrounded by the, the biggest natural park in Portugal. But it takes a village to achieve this. So this was my final notes. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Elisa, uh, for your presentation and your views. I think many of the points that you raised are very much connected as well to the other pillars of this project. Um, I noted, for example, that you, you you said dealing with an issue with that we're here dealing with an issue that is has a strong negative connotation, and that for for example, the sh hashtag shrinking smartly will not win an election. We know that, um, but we must overcome this, and I think we agree on that. And 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 the experience of Portugal in in all the th things that you mentioned, so urban development, public investment, and sustainable development, uh, investment funding instruments with also fiscal incentives for urban renewal, all of this. Um, with with uh, aiming to to boost resilience to extreme events, I think all of these will be touched upon in our in our project. But I will stop here because uh, we've been receiving a lot of questions. Um, so um, I just going to start. We, we are a bit short on time, so I'm just going to ask uh, Louis Dijkstra, who had a question or, or, or a remark, if he can uh, intervene. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Miko. I had a quick question for Albert. I really enjoyed your presentation, um, but I was struck that you were still talking about um, incentives um, to convince people to move to a particular area. And although I see the benefit for the people who take advantage of that incentive and the places that then gain uh, population, I'm a bit worried in a context where population growth at the national level is, is very weak or even negative, that we're just spending public money to redistribute population without much collective benefit. Now, maybe there's something I'm missing and maybe, you know, encouraging people to move from one place to another or paying them to move from one place to another actually does generate collective benefits um, despite the cost. But I think we need to be very explicit about that, since you know it's not it's not it's not an investment, right? If if we provide a financial incentive to a household to move, that money is gone, and we hope that we get it back in some way, right? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was referring to basically to incentive to form families and to have children uh, more than, than to move from one area to the other. And then I, 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 I'm always uh, reluctant to, to, to make some, because pr that already means that I have something in mind what's good to be promoted or not. No? But regarding fertility, when you ask people whether they want to have children, uh, many of them, they say they want to have more than the ones that they really have. So I would like to, I would like that if we, and it seems that at the state level, they would like to have higher fertility. At the individual level, they would also like to have more children. There's something that we are not necessarily uh, finding a, a way to, to make these desires to become through. So um, I would say that, uh, yeah, it, it, I think we should develop a better policy to make sure that everybody gets the children that they want to have. That's the only policy thing I'm going to say. <laughs> but based on the, the responses uh, that they provide uh, to these fertility surveys, no, that people want to have children. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, there's a question uh, from uh, Josefina Montero, uh, who's a delegate to the Rural Policy Working Party, um, and she's asking, how can we manage the, the people that still live in depopulated areas when we are thinking of demolition or changing the, the, the use of the land or the territory? How much uh, can we wait for the population or when should we start making uh, changes in the area? I think uh, maybe, Tit, uh, you could uh, give an answer to that, perhaps, if you're still there. Yep. Yeah, I think Anna also has her hand raised to answer this, actually. <laughs> or I don't know, I, I see that. Uh... I, I, I can't see any hands up, sorry. Um, oh, OK. The... So I, I see it somewhere that uh, would like to answer this question live, but um, that might be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I, I don't think we are that uh, uh, great at it uh, here in Estonia, at least. Uh, so uh, I think there are some good examples uh, in some parts uh, where, where the local municipality has been really active. For instance, there's a, a town called Volga in, uh, on the border of Estonia and Latvia, uh, and they, uh, they have actually uh, taken taken this uh, this issue on quite strategically, and I think they've been working on on working on getting the empty houses some of the empty houses down and then turning them into green like green areas uh, for some time now. And they have some success stories, but uh, it has had basically zero, I think, uh, impact on on the actually the demographic change. So I think the it is something. Uh, you can only expect uh, after many, many years that uh, that will have an impact. So I think that this is also something that makes it politically quite uh, challenging because it's hard to show that, uh, yes, we made it better. But yeah, that was my first thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deed, for, for this answer. Um, we're running short of time, but uh, I would like to ask a final question, especially to uh, Josefina, who is joining from the train, so I would like to acknowledge that. Um, uh, there is a question from Sara Bianchi uh, asking, um, do, do they know, uh, do panelists know examples of territorial strategies that are successful in tackling the problems of a local area? How, how, how has this been planned in practice and who are the actors that should be uh, involved? Josefina, I don't know if you're there. Yes. Thank you. Unfortunately, we can't hear you, Josefina. Um, we can try changing the audio. No, I think, ah, I think we heard something there, no. I'm so sorry, Josephine. We'll, we'll have to. I, I'm, I'm probably going to ask perhaps. Oh, it should now, be worse. Now, 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 now you now hear it's me? Working. Yeah, please go Wonderful. ahead. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, well, I get the question from time to time if there, if I have an experience of a municipality or a region who developed a good plan on how to adapt to a demographic change. change. And my sort of habitual answer is tends to be no, I, I didn't find any such municipality or any such region. Uh, but then I, I had a conversation earlier today with some Norwegian colleagues who did investigations on this, this in Norway, and they realized that, well, on, an, on a more generic plan, uh, plan level in, uh, in the regions, um, the question of demographic adaptation is absent. They don't talk about it. But if you go down to the different sectors like schools, elder care, uh, transportation systems and so forth, they are very much addressed at the sector level. So I think if we want to find good examples on how local governments or regional governments try to adapt to a demographic change, we should sort of go into the sectoral discussions that they have there. Uh, I think there is where we will, where we, we will find the discussion and the debate. Thank you very much. I think this is a good um, hint at what we will be doing in this in this project. Um, I want, wanted to ask the same question actually to Elisa. Um, so, do you have any ter examples of successful territorial strategies that tackle these problems that we've been talking about today? 
Um, uh, I would tend to, to, to say the same thing as Josefina, but actually I was thinking not so much in Portugal, but um, um, Urbact um, previously had a good practice uh, call, and there were some very good examples there, especially from, from, from German cities. I remember Chemnitz, and I was thinking about another one. One was about uh, housing, and the, and the other one was really about shrinking, you know, about dealing with this building stock. So I would advise you to go to, to the website of Urbact and see the good practice there. It's, uh, I don't know, it's dozens of them, but you, you, you'll you get those ones very easily. Uh, I think that those are, those are fine examples, at least those two. Perfect. Thank you so very much. Unfortunately, we do not have time to ask more questions, but I mean, many questions have been coming up. So, uh, and some have already been answered uh, by our panelists and project managers in the Q and A box. But first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting question and answer uh, session and the 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 presentations that you delivered. I am sure that we could spend hours uh, discussing about these topics, but we now have to finish up with some closing remarks. Uh, but fear not, this, this is just the beginning of the project, so stay tuned. To close this uh, kickoff event, I ha have the pleasure of giving the floor to Jose Enrique Gartilazo, uh, Deputy Head of the Regional, Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division at the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities of the OECD. So Enrique, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miguel, and, and I, I would uh, agree with you that it's been a very interesting uh, discussion and, and difficult to summarize because there were so many uh, angles to this problem of uh, dem dem how do you address demographic change. But I, I, I did take a couple of uh, of notes and observations from, from the discussion today. I think the the first part is to recognize that, that shrinking is, is, is an OECD phenomenon. You know, there, there's some countries that are still not in, in terms of entering in, in terms of shrinking. We have like a lot of Latin American countries like Mexico, Colombia, Israel. So it's not, doesn't mean that everybody, all the countries in the OECD are shrinking, but others ones like, uh, like in Japan or Korea, or even in, in EU countries, you do have a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's really kicked in. The second observation is that these, uh, these patterns of shrinking are not uniform. You know, they, they do not occur uniformly across space. And I think that's something quite, quite, quite interesting. And we saw from Dorothea's presentation that this uh, notion of the functional urban area, you know, the percentage of people are still increasing across the OECD. So there's still sort of this urbanization process and some regions like the, the, the remote ones are, are, are facing greater trends of, of uh, of, of, of shrinkage, uh, both on aging and, and elderly population. But even in what we noticed what, uh, was something that, that was quite interesting, is even in the, in, in the, in the maps that were shown by, by Castilla uh, y Leon, by, by Albert, you, you do find that even in areas of shrinkage, there are pockets of growth, of population growth. So I think my, my first reflection is, is the value added of having a place-based lens, you know, to dealing with, with shrinking. I think it's it's not a national, you, you do have to, to think about this place-based approach and at what ge ge geographic scale it makes sense to, to, to apply the, the policy. Um, and then what, what all, all, all of these shrinking means is that there's gonna be changing demands on a number of policy areas. I think it was quite interesting to see that on the one hand, with a shrinking population, you're gonna have a decline in the demand for education, but maybe an increase for health. The demands for infrastructure and housing are also going to be quite uh, quite changing. Um, some of the comments from the commission struck me that also the different segments of the population will also give different demands. We heard a lot about um, changes in the pension schemes, but also on, on the working age population or even in primary school. So I think that it's a quite complex problem that necessitates a little bit of this section of the data. Um, there's a lot of discussion in terms of what what can we do? And here's where I would like to make a couple of conclusions. What what are the instruments and policy responses? I guess the the, the first thing that I, that I take from the conversation is to first of all recognize the problem. Um, and in fact, you know, some years ago when we did the study of Japan uh, that faces the, the really high 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 rates of, of shrinking, um, they did an exercise uh, like a decade ago where they they asked all the municipalities to give their their population projections. And when they aggregated all the figures up it didn't add up to the national figures. So I think there's a lot of needs to recognize and to have a, a pretty good idea of what these population trends are. 
Uh, and the advantage uh, of this is that population can be projected uh, into the future. So we can have a pretty good idea of how the future is going to be looking at, looking at population uh, projection. So that's that's also, we heard all that it's politically, it's not, it's not very popular to talk about population decline, but it's a reality. And I think that's where evidence and data can be can be very useful to, to this policy area. The second uh, area that, that we that we heard about is the, the plan to adapt. You know, there, there's, we heard a lot about it. it's it's unavoidable in some cases. You know, don't throw your money away. Uh, it's better to 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 adapt and, and be forward looking. And and I already mentioned some of the policy areas that that we mentioned before. But here, what I what I think it's interesting is is to go from from a planning perspective that has basically gone on land use to more like a holistic spatial planning. We need to to come up with a with a multi-dimensional planning uh, uh, adaptation strategy, sort of say. And we heard that from, from Estonia, that it's necessary to, to, to involve a, a wide number of, of sectors, but also to, 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 to do this planning ac across levels of government. There, there, there's a part that deals with the national planning schemes, but also at the regional and local scale. We heard that it's, uh, it's also quite useful to, to bring in the local on board, you know, the, the traditional planning instruments that were more or less top-down imposed don't work. We need to really work with this bottom-up approach to align uh, strategies and objectives, and also to bring to, to broaden the stakeholder engagements. And it's not, it's not just a problem of the public sector. We also need to work with civil society and with the private. That's what I heard. So back to my initial remarks, I think thinking about the right scale of planning in some of these policy areas that have level, different levels of competence, even across European countries, is something that is critical. We need to adapt and, and try to think about this diversity of, of, of these demographic patterns with these policy areas. A third uh, element that I think could be interesting, we didn't hear that to, uh, a lot today, is what to do with, with, with innovation. And I think there's, there's new ways that we can deliver services. Uh, it, we know it's a reality that declining places have a, a bigger marginal cost, but we can overcome some of that marginal cost with innovative methods of, of, of trying to find out. We heard also a lot about uh, networks and uh, intermunicipal cooperation. These kinds of schemes is also a way to, to address uh, some of this problem. And the final area that, that is kind of like a little bit, I wouldn't say uh, uh, an elephant on the box is, is, is you know, if we just uh, stay here and and sit down and plan and, and wait and it's kind of like a doom scenario, right? <laughs> we were losing population, so just plan on 60 and 70 years. But I think there's a lot that, that can be done to, to also reduce the rates of, 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 of out migration and outflow. There's a lot of things that we could be doing around uh, digitalizing, rescaling the, the labor force, transforming some of the places, recognizing that you're not going to repopulate them. But you might want to think about how to make best use of some of the assets and the local uh, um, um, resources that you have, and how do you make a good use of, of innovation, of, of, of reskilling. In some places, we know that economically, it doesn't make sense to repopulate or to keep the population, but there are, for military purposes, or even to, to landscape uh, maintenance, that it makes sense to keep a certain amount of people. So doing that in a smart way, I think it's it's a, it's another policy area, but you know, as 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 we mentioned at the beginning, it's it's a complex, it's it's a it's a cross cutting uh, theme, and we're actually quite very excited to be at the beginning of this of this project uh, as we go forward. Uh, so those are some of my reflections from 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 the uh, from the session. Uh, uh, back to you, Miguel. No, thank you very much, Enrique. We will have uh, a lot of uh, time to, to talk about this, to discuss and to carry on with the project. So thank you very much to uh, the panelists, first of all, for being here. And thank you for uh, to everybody who attended this webinar once again. So uh, this is the end of the event. We went a bit beyond time, but I hope you enjoyed it. You will find more information on this project on the OECD website that has been shared in the chat. And so stay tuned and see you soon. Goodbye.